This morning, I'm really excited because our speaker is a good friend of mine. His name is Todd Stout. He uh, pastors in Manhattan, and at least once during the year, I need to give the New York people the opportunity to give a shout out to New York. Do we have any New Yorkers in the house? All right, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd has been pastoring there for eight years. I've been to this church. It is absolutely beautiful church, not just the church building itself, but the people that are there. There's a real passion uh, to minister to people in the city. Last week, we had Pastor Damian Chandler. Next week, we have Pastor Danny Hernandez. These guys are in uh, churches that are located in the cities. And here's what I know, guys. Once you leave this place, you're going to be hungry for the kind of experience that you take for granted right now. The praise, the worship, the diversity, uh, the, the, the intellectual exercise of thought. And I want to let you know that there are churches all over this country, all over this country that are ready to invite you to be a part of their communities and will engage in a way um, that will excite you and make you passionate for sharing the gospel. The church that Pastor Todd pastors is one of these churches. So I'm super excited that he gets to share with us from his heart as to what motivates him and his passions uh, for the kingdom of heaven. Good morning, Andrews. Thank you, Jose, for that nice uh, introduction. I, was, uh, I flew from New York, and I flew into Detroit, not exactly known as Sunshine City, but when we were getting an airplane to fly from Detroit to South Bend, the pilot got on and said, uh, we're leaving the sunshine now and flying into less than a mile of visibility and blustering winds and snow, and I knew that I was headed to Andrews <laughs> then. So, exactly, slow clap for <laughs> snow, slow, snow and blustery wind. Um, I want to read a, a passage for you. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 4. And it says this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those I carried into exile from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. I pray that they may have sons and daughters of their own, and that they may increase in number. Don't de decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile, and pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, as we consider uh, these words, we pray that you'll give us insight to who you are and who we are, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 17 uh, years ago on this very uh, campus, I was uh, sitting in a, a classroom, I remember it very specifically, in a classroom, I don't think the building exists anymore, um, but the old religion building, I was a, a uh, is, that, is that gone, is that right? We, they plowed that under. Um, I was sitting in a classroom there and I was just impressed with the fact that uh, God has a, a ministry and is calling Adventist Christians to be a part of the ministry in the great uh, cities of the world. My uh, wife and I had just gotten back from the, uh, the urban landscape of Tainan, Taiwan, where we served its campus ministry, right out of AU campus ministry. Do we still send people to Taiwan? Well, we spent a, a year there in, in uh, a very uh, urban environment. So I didn't have any immediate idea what this impression was going to mean for me and for my wife about uh, uh, being in the cities, but after um, I finished here, and somehow I, I crammed uh, seven years of undergraduate and graduate work here at Andrews into nine. Um, <laughs> so once we, we, we left, I, I didn't know what that impression of, of, of cities was going to mean for me, but so my wife and I... Uh, went down to pastor in Indianapolis, Indiana, sometimes known as the Manhattan of Indiana. 
Thank you, Jose, for getting that. <laughs> Have you ever been to Indianapolis? I love Indianapolis. It's a wonderful, great city. I spent five years ago. There's one spot in the city that if you stand, you feel like, you know, wow, this is really a metropolis. But if you walk one block either way, that, that, that feeling is, is lost. Um, but I, I love Indianapolis, so no offense if you're, if you're from Indianapolis. Anyway, um, after five years in, in Indianapolis, uh, my wife and I got an invitation to uh, move to uh, New York City, one of the great cities in the world, uh, where I've now pastored for the last eight years, as Jose was uh, mentioning. I, I remember a, a moment where my own kind of passion for the cities really, really took off. I was talking with some, some people, and they were telling me that they were packing up all of their earthly goods, and they had purchased some property in the hinterlands, it happened to be of Michigan, in the hinterlands of Michigan. Have you ever been into the hinterlands of Michigan? I mean, it's, you know, there, there are, there are places. So they were, why were they doing this? Because they were, quote, preparing for Jesus to come. They were preparing to Jesus, so they purchased some property in the hinterlands of Michigan, and they were, they were gonna move there. And all I could think to myself was, you know, if Jesus is coming, and you believe, as they did, that the world was unprepared, why would you go somewhere where there are no people? Amen. That just, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't get that. Why would you go somewhere where there's no, if you believe that the Jesus is coming and the world is unprepared, why would you move somewhere where there are no people and you're just going to live out by yourself? Um, so anyway, that, you know, God bless them. I, I actually don't know what has is, what is happened. I haven't followed up with them, but for me, that was just really a moment that clarified uh, God's passion for the city because I came really passionate about the, the city. We have so many people who are living in the cities. And so I came to the conclusion that, uh, that God loves the city, that God loves the city. Now, this might seem obvious to you, uh, but the reality is in American Christianity and, and specifically in Adventism, we have kind of had a tumultuous relationship with the city. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well. well. Um, <laughs> we, we, know, we know cities are Im important, but we are scared to death of them. Uh, that they, they are, are, are in, 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 the, in the, the Christian mind, in the, in the Adventist mind, often we think of them as, as crime-ridden, uh, unhealthy, uh, having full of immoral temptations, and uh, full of spiritual lethargy. And so this has led many Christians and many Adventists to just be scared to death of living anywhere uh, near the city, and so we avoid them all, at all costs, or just go in and pop in and then, and then pop out. Um, when, when my wife and I told people that we were moving to New York specifically, um, I can clearly remember many, many people who were just absolutely scared to death for us, that we were moving into this hell hole. Uh, I think the, the Sodom was quoted on several times in that they were going to be praying for our, our safety and our uh, salvation. Ironically, my wife and we live in the Upper East Side, one of the safest neighborhoods in all of New York, and by the way, New York is, I think, the, the 30th safest city in the, the country. Um, it's, it's where we happen to be is extremely uh, safe. Anyway, when we told people we were moving to New York, they were just terrified for our salvation and, and everything else. So, uh, so this would lead me to ask uh, this question on your behalf. You know, what then, uh, with this mindset, what makes me able to say that God loves the city? Uh, well, cities are really nothing more than great gatherings of people I mean, a, a city is really nothing without people, right? And everything that I've read in the Bible is that God loves people. Have you heard that before? For, for God so loved the world. I mean, the most famous text in all. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. God, God loves people. He's into the people. And people, at an increasing level, are moving into the city. So are you aware of this? In 2008, 
for the first time in human history, uh, the, the uh, UN Population Fund documented this, for the first time in human history, at least recorded human history, more people live in the city than in rural areas. And it's only increasing. By 2050, it's estimated that 68% of the population of the world will live in and around cities. And, and some say by the end of this century, over 90% of the world's population will live in and around the major cities of the world, places like Mexico, Mexico City and, and the, the many cities in Brazil, and again, New York and Los Angeles and Tokyo. And the cities are growing rapidly. And God loves people, and so God loves the city. Uh, let me give you some uh, Bible examples to back this idea up of God loving the city. Uh, Jesus. You know, unlike his, his wild man cousin, you remember Jesus' wild man cousin? I mean, he wore like, thank you, he wore, um, he wore like the, the, the fur and he lived out in the, where? In the hinterlands of Michigan, in, in the wilderness. And he was famous. I mean, he was, he was such a great preacher. People would go out to see him, but they had to pack their backpacks and they went out into the, the hinterland and they went to see this uh, John the Baptist, but un unlike John, Jesus spent his time in the cities. In fact, he made his headquarters in C Capernaum, a, a bustling city of the day. Well, it makes sense. Jesus was about interacting with people, and to interact with people, you've got to be around people, and so many of the stories you read from the Gospels, Jesus in the cities helping people, made his headquarters in a bustling town. Uh, think about the, the, uh, the New Testament. You know, the New Testament is made up of a lot of letters to churches. But what I find interesting is where those churches were located. The great cities of the day. Ephesus, Corinth, Philippi, Rome. The New Testament church was, was born and, and bred in the cities, in the great cities of the ancient Roman world. God loves the city. In order to have an impact on the ancient Roman world, you had to have an impact on the city, so the churches were based in the cities. That was essential. And then things spread out from there. You know, you've heard this before. The word pagan actually meant people who, who lived in the rural areas. It was, the, it was the Christians who were in the city. The churches were centered in the city. Corinth, Philippi, Ephesus, Rome. These were the centers of influence in the ancient world. Um, I've heard this uh, philosophy from Adventists that, uh, you know, don't, don't live in the city, but you, you go into the city and influence, and then you run out as quickly as possible. We have people, they try this all the time. Can I tell you this? This does not work. <laughs> this is, especially in a place like New York. New Yorkers are very cynical. It's part of just the DNA of New York that you're cynical, especially cynical about people who come from outside and just showed up two minutes ago and, and, and are wanting to tell everybody what they should do. And so this mentality that Christians and Adventists often have about the cities, in particular in New York, we're going to run in, we're going to tell people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and we're going to get out of there as quickly as possible. It doesn't, it doesn't work because if you're going to have an influence with people, People need to know that you care about them and you love them and you do that by living next door to them and being with them and they see you as part of the, the, the community. The, the early Christians, they lived in the cities. Priscilla and Aquila, they, they had small groups over at their homes and they started churches in the hearts of the cities and the church grew from there, from the city outward. The church was centered in the great cities. This example, I love this one. Revelation chapter 21. Listen to what Revelation, this is, this is all under the category of God loves the city. Revelation chapter 1 says this. This is John, this revelator. He's talking about what's going to happen at the end of time, right? In Revelation chapter 21, he says, Then I saw, he's in, he's in vision, he's seeing this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. 
God loves cities so much that in the great description of what is to happen at the end when the world is made new, what does he describe? A city where people are living together in, in close proximity. They're living in apartments together. God's house, you remember that God's house? It's not a mansion, it's a, it's a house. It's an apartment building where we're living together. This is the imagery, the city imagery. God loves this city. Okay, so uh, what does this mean for you and for me? Well, in all likelihood, if you plan on getting a job, you get everybody planning on getting a job at some point, you're working, you're learning, you're, you're, you're going to class right now, I would imagine you're not just doing that for edification. Some of you may be independently wealthy and just plan on you know, living on your estate Batman style. Um, for the rest of you, I would imagine you plan on getting jobs. Reality, most of the jobs are in or near cities. There are rural jobs, certainly. And for those of you who, by the way, plan to live a rural existence, I'm having a little bit of fun, but you know, amen to you. We need people everywhere. I'm here to talk about the city today, but amen if you're in the rural areas and plan on being there. But for the most of us, we're going to live in and around cities if you plan on getting jobs because that's where the, the jobs are. So the question then is, how do I live as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus, and also live in the city? That's the big, big question that I had when I was, and I have as I'm living in the city, and that many of the people I know who are living in the city, and for those of you that I want to address before we go, um, as you think about where you're going in the year or two or three uh, to come. How do you live effectively as a person of faith and, and be in the city? Well, back to Jeremiah chapter uh, 29. Jeremiah, this is an interesting story. So in this case, you have these, these people who are like God's representatives, the Israelites, and they are forced to go live in a city that is not their own. Not just any city, but what city? Babylon. The, 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 the great, the infamous Babylon. They're, they're forced to go and live in this city. And many of them are not happy about it. They're good, they're good, old, they're good Adventists. They don't want to live in the city. So, but they're forced to go and live in great Babylon. And so God has to send them a letter to tell them how to, how to interact in this city. And it's recorded again in Jeremiah chapter 29. We read it at the beginning. It says this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those I carried into ex exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You're in this city now. Build houses. They, 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 this was mind-blowing to them, by the way. Build houses and settle down. Settle down. We're in Babylon. We don't want to get settled here. We've got to get out of here as quickly as possible. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what you produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may too have sons and daughters and increase in number. Don't decrease. Settle down. Live in the city. Be engaged with the city. And then this, verse 7. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into. Seek the peace and prosperity of Babylon? Are you kidding me? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city. I would say to you, if you think, well, how do I live as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus in a, a city? Well, Jeremiah gives us some good advice. Hey, seek the peace and the prosperity of that city. Seek good for that city. Pray for that city that you live in. Yes, you, you may be settled down. You may start a family there. My wife and I, we moved to the city. My wife was six months uh, pregnant. We, we, we had a house in, let me tell you about this verse. We had a house in Indianapolis. Five bedrooms. So cheap. Wonderful. Because you can buy a house with five bedrooms in Indianapolis. Lovely city. I had a house. I moved to Harlem, to West Harlem. And our house was the size, our apartment was the size of one and a half of our rooms. And we had to walk up four stairs because we couldn't afford a, a, an elevator. And so we walked, my wife was six months pregnant. 
she's still not quite gotten over that. She's forgiven me, but it's, we're, we're all good now. So she's pregnant and we're walking up. Settle down, have kids. We've had three kids since we've been there, all, all born and bred now in, in New York City. Settle down, have kids there, live, and seek the peace and prosperity of the city. If you end up, once you're done with your experience here at good old AU in the city, take Jeremiah's advice. Seek the peace and the prosperity of that city. Well, how do, how do you do that? How do you, how do you seek the peace and the prosperity of the place that you're going to live in, especially if it's as a city? Well, this is where we get to a New Testament idea. It's Matthew chapter 5. It's from Jesus' uh, words himself. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. He gives two great metaphors. He says, talking about the, the disciples, talking to the disciples, the newborn baby Christian church that he's raising up. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He also says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How do we seek the peace and prosperity of the, of, of the city and live as followers of, of Jesus in a place that maybe doesn't always cultivate that naturally? Jesus comes and said, look, be salt and be light. Mix into the, into the life of the place that you're, you're living and do good for it. Be a, a good flavor. Salt is supposed to be a good flavor. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever eaten something that you wanted to be delicious and it didn't have enough salt and it needed salt and then you put it? But then have you also, this, this is another now, this is a side note. Have you also eaten something and then it either has too much salt or it has a clump of salt in it? Have you ever eaten something that has a clump of salt? That is the most disgusting thing ever. I hope that's never happened at the calf over here where you're eating and there's some delicious soup and then, does that ever happen? And there, thank goodness, no, but and there's a big chunk of salt that's clumped together. Clumped together salt is disgusting. Preach it. <laughs> salt is supposed to mix in and flavor other things. So how do we seek the peace and prosperity of the city? You mix in with the, 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 the city and, you, and you're good and you're flavorful. Sometimes Christians are taste disgusting. I, I you know, we're on the subway and God bless them, but there are Christians who feel compelled to get on the subway when everyone is, we want to mind our own business and you want to read your book and you don't want to be interfered with, but there are Christians who feel compelled to pick the most obscure texts of the Bible and read them at the absolute top of their lungs in the, in the subway. In their mind, this is, but for many people, that's disgusting. That t- for me, it's a little disgusting. Or preach like very obscure things from the Bible at the top of their lungs in the subway, hurtling along. You can't get out. There's nowhere you can go. All you have to do is listen to the. This is this is not mixing in and being flavorful. This is kind of being disgusting. Too often people are left with a, a disgusting flavor in their mouth. Salt is supposed to taste good. It's supposed to flavor things. And so, mixing in. Live as a follower of Jesus. Live as a, a dis- disciple. And do good for your community. Followers of Jesus are supposed to be identifiably positive. People are supposed to say, oh, I don't know anything about that person, but they identifiably are doing a good thing. Uh, there's this guy who's written, a historian, he's not a Christian, who has written um, about the rise of Christianity. How, how did... Christianity go from being just a small group of like under 200 people in the first century to being one of the dominant uh, forces in the Roman world by the third century? It's a great question. Rodney Stark is the name of the historian. And so he writes in his book, The Rise of Christianity. He said, Christians in the, in the first century, they did things like this, identifiably good things. In the ancient Roman world, when you had a, a baby that you did not want, 
So uh, unlike abortion today where you would, you would get rid of the baby before the baby was born, in ancient Rome where you need, the baby was born, and by the way, this wasn't just Rome, but places like Egypt, and so this is well recorded, you would have the baby, and if you didn't want the baby, it, w- it was a girl, for example. Unfortunately, gender equality was not part of the equation back then. You had a baby you didn't want. You know what you did? You put it outside, and the wolves would come get it. And so then you could say, well, we didn't kill the baby. The wolf killed the baby. But they were, the babies would be gone, and that's how you uh, would get rid of a baby. We know this. This is recorded in letters from Roman soldiers back to their wives and so on. So you know what the Christians did? What do you think they did? Newborn baby Christian church. They would go and collect the babies and take care of the babies. Now, there's an influence. They're doing good. That's being flavorful. I mean, you imagine how long it took for people to be influenced by that. Who are these people that go and collect the babies that nobody else wants and help to, to raise them? That's being flavorful and good to your community, to your city. That's being a tasty and not disgusting. When I think of being salt and light in the city, I think of uh, friends of mine like uh, my good friend Derek Linton, who is an attorney. He's actually the deputy bureau chief in the Bronx. So he works in the DA's office in the park. He, you know, shows like, like Law and Order. Is that still on anyway? Law and Order. You remember Law and Order? Or these shows? Like that's that's my friend Derry Lane. He's deputy bureau chief, um, and so it, specifically on v- working in violent crime. So I I call him on like Wednesday. In fact, if I, I know if I was calling, we were just texting earlier that, that he would be telling me he was just involved with the police sh- shooting. Um, where he's investigating this crazy police shooting. And so, um, but, but Derek, good friend, working in the bureau's office, but he is also a faithful follower of Jesus. He's our head elder of our church. Working to be, to be salt, to be tasty in the community, doing good, being a follower of Jesus, living in the city. I think of uh, Paul Mikov, another friend of mine. I had lunch with Paul two weeks ago. He's the vice president now of CMMB. He was... Uh, formerly at World Vision, one of the great NGOs in the world. And so he's now at CMBB, which works to provide medical resources and education for uh, women and children around the world. So they gather resources and materials to give to these women and children in far-off places and uh, who are facing turmoil. And so Paul, working to be salt and light in the city, also faith. He's preaching at my my church in three weeks. Paul Miko. I think of uh, Sylvia Hordish, who her, her husband is is somewhat elderly now, but up to the a couple years ago, she was an elder in my congregation. She's my neighbor. She lives right next door to me. Uh, Sylvia works for uh, UN Women, and her job is to to promote gender equality in places where uh, women have not had any form of equality. In fact, have been subjected to all kinds of turmoil for centuries. She, she works with UN women to help promote gender equality. It is possible to have a profound influence by being salt and light in whatever place, whether it's rural or urban, whatever place that you go. So when you leave in, in three or two or one years or whatever, and you move wherever you move, whether it's to the city or wherever, you can be salt and light by having a positive influence on your community, by living the gospel. God has done something great on our behalf through the work of Jesus, and we have the opportunity to share that. And that doesn't always mean uh, preaching. In fact, it often doesn't mean uh, preaching. There are so many many ways to communicate the, the good news, and Jesus invites us to be salt and light. And we can do this in the great cities of this world that are dying, literally dying for something good. Dying for good news. Go and seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which you'll live in. You are talented. You have many things going for you. Use those things to seek the peace and prosperity and be salt and light wherever you go. Now, before I end, and I am ending, I'm landing the plane right here, but let me just add this one addendum on. I know a lot of of friends and young adults who leave places like Andrews, like right here. Andrews is great. I mean, you have great worship. You, have, you can go to multiple worship experiences. 
I know that there are groups meeting and all kinds of exciting spiritual things that can be uh, good for you. But I know many of you will leave here and you will have a hard time finding a place like Andrews. Because you'll get out to cities in this country and you will find that there are a lot of unhealthy churches. And you will go to those churches and you will be immediately bummed out. I promise you that this is going to happen because there are a lot of unhealthy churches out there. And so you want to be a part of the community of faith and you're inspired with all this knowledge and you want to be salt and light and then you will get in to a church community and you will find that it is unhealthy because a, a lot of our cities don't have healthy churches. Either they, they have churches that are not healthy, they don't have any churches at all. By the way, our church is, is, is thinking about planting a new congregation. We're looking at, at places to plant. Do you know that Brooklyn, if Brooklyn was taken off from New York City, it would be the the fourth largest city by itself in the country. Brooklyn has one non-ethnic specific church in the entire city. Millions of people in in Brooklyn. There's not enough churches there. You're going to get out and you're going to find there are places either with no church, especially if you're in the cities because Adventists, we haven't, we haven't really done a great job of loving the city. You're going to get the city. You're not going to find great churches. You're going to find churches that are really, really unhealthy. I challenge you not to settle for living as an isolated Christian. It's real easy to do. You get, you go to the church. The church is like a bum experience of all time. Before long, you're, you know, you're tuning in to, to Pastor Dwight on the video and you, you're never back. We need communities in cities, communities of people like you who are empowered to be disciples of Jesus. So if you don't find a healthy church, I don't help to raise one up. Start a small group. Get, get, I, I would imagine that there are other young adults who want to raise things up. Raise up churches. We need more churches in cities like, like Brooklyn. And, and if you can't find something, call me. All right? So I, I, I will try to hook you up with Jose. I'm, I'm, our, our congregation is really committed to this, I, I must admit. We're committed to the work in the city. So if you get out there and you can't find a church, the last thing, email me, call me. We'll work together to figure something out. God needs communities of faith. God needs you in the great cities of this world. As he works to bring about an end to all things for Jesus to come back and there to be people who are ready to live in relationship eternally with him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for everyone here And I thank you for their minds and what you're doing through their classes here at Andrews. And I pray that you will prepare them that when they leave here, they can be your followers and can be salt and light in this world wherever they go. In Jesus' name, amen.